Hi, everybody. It is such a pleasure to be able to introduce our next keynote speaker. He is a programming language architect at Microsoft. He is the chair of the Standard C++ Foundation, which is the organization that is putting on this conference we are all enjoying so much. He is also the chair of the ISO C++ Committee. He has been working with this language for over 30 years, and he is extremely concerned with its evolution and its longevity. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Herb Sutter. Well, welcome, everyone. I, I hope you're having a great conference. And I have a cheat sheet, because I've been talking with you all week, and I know you're having a great conference. That was a great keynote yesterday. It's so great, I'm going to mention it, because it ties in so well with what I want to talk about today. But as we speak in this talk, I want to give sort of part two, a continuation of a talk I gave here last year about evolution of C++. And I'm not going to assume that you saw that talk but I'm also going to try not to repeat it. So I'm gonna start with a, a summary of what the highlights are of the approach and the, the reasons why and the goals. But I'm gonna refer you to last year for all the nice in-depth treatment and live demos and that kind of thing. But I'm very concerned about safety and simplicity in C++. Uh, just curious, how many of you would be interested in seeing C++ get significantly simpler and type memory safer? One or two. So let's talk about a brief summary of last year. So this is the first slide I showed last year. There are lots and lots of incubations and experiments and new languages gaining traction in the marketplace that are trying to solve some of these same problems. And these are all good things. These are great experiments because languages learn from each other. We've had tens of thousands of programming languages in our industry, short history. This is good. Many of them are looking at greenfield design, new idioms and styles they're exploring, new package management, new modules, new concepts. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm interested in the other side of this, which is what can we do to refresh C++ itself? To make the guidance that we already have learned over 30 years and that we teach regularly the default, so the compiler helps us more and fights us less. To make C++ modules and concepts that we already have that are standard, the default. To keep our entire ecosystem and package managers and compatibility. And I'm going to hammer quite a bit on that in the latter part of the talk. But that's the side that I'm interested in. And so the experiment that I offered was, what if we could do C++ 11 feels like a new language again, because it really did feel like a different language, but it was an evolution of C++. It was fully compatible. What could, if we could do that again for the whole language, instead of uh, individual useful features, do it holistically and see, can we reboot an alternate syntax for C++ where we can fix the defaults, where we can make the guidance that we already teach the default and reduce what we have to teach and learn and know by 10x, and increase safety by 50x. To me, if I had to put one slide together, so I did, about the important themes, to me the main theme is I love C++. I want to keep using C++, and I want 100% pure C++, just nicer. So 10x simpler to me means that I can measure and if you've seen my previous talks, I've tried to do the work to catalog hundreds of rules to, to prove to myself that, yes, in this path, I don't need to teach 90% of that, including the stuff I wrote, anymore, which would make me happy to obsolete my own books. And to make the language 50x safer, specifically with the metric, because goals without metrics are useless, the metric being 98% fewer reported vulnerabilities, in the four big areas, type, memory, initialization, and lifetime safety. So we want the, the bound safety, type safety, initialization, and lifetime. But we also want this to still be C++, and one huge metric for that is I should be able to call any C++ code seamlessly. No thunking, no marshalling, no impedance and wrapping in the interop. 
I also want this to be easily adoptable. I'm going to hammer, expand on that a lot toward the back end of the talk. We always need 100% binary compatibility, otherwise we can't do the, the friction-free interrupt thing. And we want a 100% backward source compatibility, but apply the zero overhead principle to the language. Don't pay for it unless you use it. So that I can write, and I demonstrated this live on stage last year, you can write a file that contains all today's C++ and one line of syntax2, what I call CPP2 for short. And you can mix them, interleave them in the same file, and you, or you can turn that dial all the way to have a file that is only syntax2, and all that works. And if you're in that world, then in the future, if this experiment goes somewhere, you could work with 10x simpler tools and compilers for that language, and then get the benefit, and you still have full backward source compatibility to mix the syntaxes whenever you need it. And to teach what we already teach and make it the default. Almost all the code I'm gonna show on the slides is screenshots because doing demos takes time, but this is real code, and I, to keep myself honest, I'm going to show you screenshots of code that works today. So again, caveats, this is my personal experiment. The implementation very much like Bjarne did with Cfront to transpile C with classes and then C++ to C is to say transpile syntax two to syntax one. To start a conversation about what can we do within C++'s own evolution, not going somewhere else to a competing language, to rejuvenate C++ itself. And from the outset, it has to work with every major compiler. So if you have any recent compiler, it's always worked since last year and still through to today. Currently, that's GCC 10, Clang at least down to version 12, VS 2019, or higher. Any reasonably conformant C++ 20 compiler works today. And I want to thank, since last year, when I first opened the repo, uh, there have been lots of issues in PRs by over 100 people, over 120 contributors. These are just the names of people who've opened issues or PRs. There are even more names of people who've commented and given great feedback. So thank you very much to all of you. So the summary of what I showed last year, and again, for all the demos, go to last year's video on YouTube. I demonstrated bounds and null checking by default. Now we have friction-free interop with a standard library as with all C++ libraries, which means I just use std vector, no wrapping, no thunking, right? But when you use it from syntax two, subscript is bounds checked. Array, subscript is bounds checked. Span, string, and all of your types that have subscript are just bounds checked by default. We have 100% guaranteed initialization before use. And if you don't believe me, please go back to the video and see the examples with nice diagnostics like you initialize this local variable on this branch of the if, but not on this branch, and tell you the exact line numbers and what you need to do to fix it. I demonstrated contracts with pre, post conditions and assertions, const being the default, no discard being the default, make unique being the default for new, no pointer arithmetic and much more. And for simplicity, we talked about unified safe conversion. So for type safety, is and as are all the safe queries, including for static and dynamic typing. There's a talk uh, that's after this one by Philip, who you'll be seeing later, who talking about the implementation of is and as and CPU front. And unified function call syntax, which works great, including for the C standard library right out of the box. Yes, you can write my file dot fprintf, and that works. See last year's demo. And I've already brought all the major parts of this to the ISO C++ committee as proposals for today's syntax to improve today's C++, and I'll continue to do that. So that was a summary. Let me now talk about what's new since last year and really try to focus on the theme of simplification through generalization. Uh, how many of you, by the way, recognize that quote, simplification through generalization? Yeah, it's not me. That's Bjarne talking, and he's right. So let's talk about trade-offs. Simplicity, safety, efficiency. Are they the iron triangle where you can pick any two? 
That's how they're often presented. Ah, we got to accept overheads to be safe. We, we got to accept safety concessions to be simple. That's not true. I don't believe it. If you find the right abstractions, nearly always you can have all three and only pay for the things you actually are asking for. And the key is to find abstractions that let the programmers say what they mean, to directly express their intent. Let me give you three examples of things that I've implemented since last year's talk that I think illustrate that principle. So the spaceship operator, which is now standard in C++20, came from my CPP2 work. Uh, there were discussions in the committee, so I had a, a, a design in my back pocket. I contributed it, and it was standardized. So in the standard, it is all of CPP2's comparison stuff, including default comparisons and the symmetry and all that, except for chain comparisons. That one hasn't been standardized in today's syntax yet. So I've implemented it. Uh, you may be familiar with this in other languages, and this is better. Let me tell you why. First, it's simple. I can, a bounds check is if min is less than or equal to index is less than max, right? I didn't have to say index twice. It's safe because you can only write the mathematically correct and sound transitive chains. So any chain of less than or equal or equal, you can reason about if they're all true, you can reason about the endpoints. The relationship between the endpoints is less than or equal to also. Same thing with chains of greater, equal, or greater. <clears throat> Same with chains of double equal. And nothing else. So in Python, for example, you can write other chains, like the ones I show in red. And you have to look at the documentation that says, by the way, don't do that. They're pitfalls. And I asked Guido, we work at the same company now. I'll refer to Guido again later. Uh, Guido Van Rossum, the, the inventor of Python. And I asked him, have you considered clawing that back and, and taking it away? Or what do you think about those chains? He said, well, and it sounded so much like C++. It sounded, well, people overload them, and they rely on that now. And it's, we can't take it away, so we have to warn people not to do that. Sound familiar? Once you're popular, once you have users, you know, you have backward compatibility is, is uh, always there. But because I'm implementing them for the first time in this compiler, they don't exist yet. I just made the transitively uh, non-mathematical ones compile time errors. You just can't write them. You can only write the safe ones. And they're efficient because that middle one, index, or however many middle ones there are, get evaluated only once. So it's simple, and it's safe, and it's efficient. I like that, and it shows the tension. Those three things are not always in tension. Here's another example. I've also implemented named break and continue. Sometimes you do write nested loops. Yes, Sean, sometimes you do. And when you do, today, sometimes you want to break or continue the inner one or the outer one. And the way we do it is we write extra variables and we do some extra housekeeping. Here, like in other languages, I didn't, I'm not the first to invent this, you simply give it a name like you do in everything in, in syntax two. It's name that you're introducing colon, which you pronounce is a, and then the thing. So outer is a while loop. And then inside that loop, I can simply break or continue. And I also currently, part of my experiment, I can always take this back, but currently, I'm enforcing that if you named it, you must write break or continue that name. Otherwise, why did you name it? It's probably an error if you gave it a name and then didn't use it. But it's simple. I can directly express my intent without creating an extra housekeeping variable like I do today. It's safe because it's structured. There's nothing unstructured about this. And it's efficient. You can't do better by hand. The third example is main. So I, those three lines, which is actually one line, but it's big font, so I, I broke it in two places, that is a complete program with dash pure, pure CPP2. If you're in a pure CPP2 only file, that's a complete program. I didn't have to include anything to get the IO streams because the import, the, uh, the standard library is just always available by default in pure syntax two. It's simple because I didn't have to include anything. I could omit the arrow int. It's implicit for main. I know what main is. 
And notice this is using the short syntax or functions where I don't have to write the braces if it's just a single statement body. The braces are implicit. It's safe. Those arguments are a plain old std vector of a plain old C++20 std string view. That is safe. And you get all the usefulness of starts with, ends with, trim, and all the substring and those things as well. And notice that I say args sub zero there on the right at the end. Now, I know that's always going to be OK, because environments put the program name there, right? But the compiler will bounce check it for you anyway. So that if something should happen, or say you port to a system that doesn't put it there, you will get immediately, at the first time you test this code, you will get an error, because that subscript is also bounce checked by default. And this is zero overhead. You only pay for what you use if you don't write that args, that you're not going to look at the command line arguments. You don't pay for any of that. You don't pay for the vector of string view, for example. So you can't do better by hand. It's simple, it's safe, and it's efficient. So those are just three fairly small things. But the reason I show them is A, they're new, so it's part of my status report and update, but also B, because I think it illustrates why simplicity, safety, and efficiency do not need to be intention and very often aren't. So, Back in 2017 at this conference, I gave a talk where I talked a lot about meta classes. And so I've been implementing those as type meta functions in CPP2. And I used this metaphor of James and the giant peach and then changed it to Bjarna and the unified universe. And what did I mean by that? One of the things Bjarna did, I mean, it's right from the beginning, right in the name, C with classes, right? The C++ class is a wonderful thing in the world of software. It is one of the most powerful and general things we have. We can use a C++ class, the same C++ class, without extra language support for something divergent, to express interfaces, which are separate things in some languages, to express iterators, to express base classes, to express functors or callable objects, which overload the paren operator, to express predicates, which is a subset of that subset. Those are predicates that were, those are function call operators that return bool, for example. Value types, com classes, pod values, variants, dynamic types like any. We can express all these things with a C++ class. It's that powerful and that flexible. Say, Jim, Bjarne started doing this back in 1979. I know he listened to a lot of Beatles. Do you think he got any inspiration for this? Well. There is a song that kind of fits this. All you need is class. All you need is class. All you need is class. Class. Class is all you need. All you need is class. Now sing with me. All you need is class. Thank you. All you need is class. Class. Class is all you need. All right. <laughs> so does that give you the point? <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> yeah. class. And that's the point. Thank you very much, Jim. So Bjar and I got that point a long time ago. In fact, the meta class's goal, in a nutshell, has always been simply to let you write the defaults, generated functions, and other common characteristics of a class that you're intending to write as compile time code. And I demonstrated it, and now I've implemented it. This idea is to make classes easier to write, and our compilers already do it. For all of C++, if you wrote the class, the, the source code on the left-hand side, what actually you get is the class are struck with much more, with all these generated functions and defaults. Notice there's also uh, virtual defaults, public defaults. And you get that because the compiler runs essentially a compile-time metaprogram. The only problem with this is that's the metaprogram. It's baked into the language. There's one set of defaults for all types. 
And you can pick good defaults that are, that are right much of the time, but they will be wrong sometimes. How many of you have had to fight a wrong default in the language when it's, the class has generated something you didn't intend? And so what do we have? Equals delete. And we need to then turn things off because we got things we didn't want. But the fundamental root cause is because there's only one metaprogram that's baked in the language. So my thesis is, what if you could write your own code here? Nothing really wild here. Not, we're not making it a mutable language, but just to express the defaults that you would like under a single opt-in name. So all we're doing is saying, the compiler, the moment it is finished parsing what the source code the user wrote, you've got the grammar tree, the parse tree. The very next step it would normally do is ODR. It was like, okay, that's the one definition and bake it in stone. So right before that, in that very disciplined small space, we have one disciplined hook where you can say, and before we cast this in stone, you can update, modify what the user wrote to fill in defaults, to change things. This is your one hook, and then once you're done, it's ODR rules. You've got the one definition. So how do we do this? The example I often use, not because I love OO, but because it's a simple example that's in other languages as a language feature, is interface. And so I've showed this slide like six years ago. This is a screenshot on the left-hand side of the C-sharp language specification for the interface feature, which is separate from the class instruct features in the C-sharp language, and the same thing in Java. It is 18 pages of standard ease, of English text that the compiler writer then goes and implements in the C-sharp compiler. My proposal 10 years ago was that code, the syntax has changed slightly, but only slightly, was this code to say, I think I can have the equivalent power express exactly the same thing as those 18 pages of C-sharp language spec as a 10-line meta function. As, say, a const expert block where I say, oh, I require that I loop through each, each variable. There must not be data members. Uh, every function, you can't have copy or move, and if it's not virtual, I make it virtual and public by default, that kind of thing. So that was the code that I showed six years ago. Here is the code in CPP front today, and the only thing I did was that last line, if not, has detour actually goes to a shared function, so I just manually inlined it, but this is still legal code that runs today to express the same thing. And that is the equivalent of those 18 pages of C-sharp language spec, and all it's saying is, you know that class that can express anything? Right now, I'm not trying to write anything. I'm trying to write an interface. So tell me if I put in a data member and make it an error. Apply the default of public and virtual to my function if I didn't write it myself. So I don't have to write it, because defaults are great. So here's another example I gave from how, that shows how to use it from my spring update blog post. And there's a lot of comment there about all the things that the meta function does for you. But the key part is this, that the word interface carries all that meaning above in those, uh, that paragraph of text. Everything's public and virtual by default, no data members, et cetera. As a convenient and readable opt-in, all I needed to say was run the interface meta function here. At, this is an interface type. And we didn't have to hardwire it specially into the language. It's just a class, which also means I don't have to extend the template system to learn about other things that are not classes and deal with those. It's just a class. It works with templates. It works with name lookup. It works with overload resolution. It works with everything out of the box because it's a class. So that's the idea. Here's another example. So again, there's lots of description about what this meta function in particular does, but the key part is here at the bottom where it says, the word value says all that as a convenient and readable opt-in without hardwiring regular type into the language. We all know what a regular type is. If I want to write one in syntax two, all I say is point two D is a value type. And then I don't have to write, oh, is it comparable? That generates comparison, including strong orderings. It generates that you have member-wise copy and move and you never need to equals delete because you only get what you opt into. 
So there are two very, very important things that, uh, that, that may, if, if you're like me, will send a, a shiver up your spine no matter how many times you've said this. Every name, it's, naming is a word of power, so I can create a new word of power for somebody to use. And it's opt-in, which means I only get what I ask for. So in, in CPP2, if you write a naked type with no body, the only thing it has is a default constructor because you didn't write any constructor at all, and a destructor because every type has that. That's it. And if you wrote a constructor, you don't even get the generated default constructor. Everything is opt-in, and that's powerful. But I don't, it's not cumbersome, I just say a word of power. So I've implemented these common meta functions, all of which were in that paper, that meta classes paper, P707. And now let me tell you about a couple more that I've implemented since then, since the spring. In C, Enum is a special language type. So Enum job state, either running paused, and it's fine. <laughs> C++11 extended Enum and added Enum class. So now you can specify the underlying type if you want to, and you get some safety with Enum class. You get, because it's scoped Enum. And when Bjarne and I wrote this paper, our main concern was safety, and this also came from the C++ CLI work, which had a similar idea in it. In CPP2, I don't have a special enum type or enum class type. I just have a meta function on an ordinary type where you can say job state is an enum type, idle, running, paused. And it's with semicolons because the contents of that, that body is just a series of declarations. And notice I didn't even put a colon in a type because I've defaulted those too. Because you run the meta function, the enum meta function just goes through and infers the type inf and it puts in the values if you didn't write them yourself. The meta function can apply defaults and force requirements and generate code. And it's just as safe as enum class, but I think it's safer because you actually can't create a value of job state that is anything but one of those three. At least I don't know of a way to do it because I shut the doors and I think I shut them all. You can get an explicit conversion to the underlying type if you want to, but I actually gave it a name to make it super explicit, like get, a, get value type, get raw value. If you want to specify the underlying type, you can, but that's a more familiar syntax. Oh, job state is an enum of U64. We're, that's a syntax we're familiar with. And oh, idle has a default value. So now I'm going to declare it, but with an implicit type equals, so idle is a value equal to 10. And the others just become 11 and 12, because we can compute that. It's code, so we can compute things. So that's fine so far. But what other things do people do with enums? Um, I want to point out this Stack Overflow question. How, how many of you have tried to write a, have written a flag enum in C++? Yeah, it's a popular indoor sport. Notice this question, and this is just one Stack Overflow question. Like, there are others, right? This is just one. It was written 14 years ago, so it's old. It was modified two months ago, so it's current. It was viewed more times than almost any CppCon talk video. <laughs> so it's in high demand. But what do we do today? We write it ourselves. But in CPP2, there is also a flag enum. Animal flags is a flag enum. And enum and flag enum share the same basic enum implementation. They're both like five liners around the same basic enum. It's a flag enum with an underlying type of U16 type where ha with members has clause, can fly, eats fish, endangered. And now the default values are powers of two, not starting at one, not incrementing starting at zero. And you can do things like, say, a can fly or eats fish or endangered. And that just works. And you will get output like shown below if you use that and you convert it to a string. Yes, we can do this. But all I did was, after I wrote the enum meta function, just generalized it a little and added that expressive power too. And most of the code is reused. 
let me actually take you into the code. This is the most code you will see, and, I, and I'm gonna skim through it, but just to give you an idea of what the code actually does. So first we have a loop where we have a loop scope variable value, which is the value I'm gonna keep computing and then update through the loop. And so for each member, so whatever the user wrote, I'm now reflecting over the members of that type, do for every member m, if it's a member object, and that's just an ordinary if is the body of, of it, you can do this in, in C++ today. Um, it's just more convenient here and a bit nicer. So for each member, for that member m, if it's an object, require that it's public and that it's, uh, or that it has default access, so we're gonna make it public. It, has to, it cannot be protected or private. And then I'm gonna go do some computation that I'm gonna skip with those dots. And eventually I'm going to stick it into an ordinary vector of some housekeeping stuff. That's enumerator's pushback, ordinary vector of some strings. I've got its name, I've got its type, I've got its value as strings, and I'm just gonna store that. And then notice near the bottom, mark for removal from enclosing type. Because I could just modify it more in place, but it's easier for me to just say, yes, thank you, you've told me what you want, and I'm gonna take it out and put, put in what you actually asked for. You'll see that in a second. Then we compute the default underlying type. If the user didn't specify it, I'll skip that part. Then I say, remove all those marked members. So all the data members, the value members that I processed, remove those. Don't worry, they're about to come back better. And then I'm going to call a series of add member calls. Now, I want to be very clear about what this add member call is doing. This is not an undisciplined, unscoped, unstructured, throw some, throw some string at the compiler. This is super disciplined. T is strongly typed. It is, the T is a type declaration in, in, uh, in the reflection API. On the type declaration, add member takes a string, but it must be a valid source string of a declaration, which is the only thing you can put inside a type scope. So what happens with that string is it actually goes back into the normal lexer tokenizer, the normal parser, and says take the string and now, and now parse it as if the user had written it right here. If there are errors, you'll get the normal errors as if the user had written it and those errors will appear to the user. But if it succeeds, then just add that into, just take that, that pointer to the declaration node you just got and add it to the declaration nodes of the parse tree for T. That's all, you just add the member. And so I add a value member, which is the value I have storing of the underlying type. I write a private constructor, which is only used by, the, by setting the value members of this type, the static const text remembers. I provide a get raw value function that is a this, it's a member function, a const member function that returns the value of the underlying type, so it's explicit. I have copying and, 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 and move construction and assignment. I have all of the comparisons in those two lines. And then if this is a bitwise type, so if this is a flag enum, I'll also add another member of type uh, of name none with value zero. So anytime you write a flag enum, you can also test it for none if no flags are set, and that will be correct. And then I'll add all the bitwise operators, including the compound assignment, and then has set and clear for specific bits or combinations of bits. So it's usable for all those things. But it's just code. But notice the, the mental model. When I write this meta function, it runs at compile time. It just modifies, it's my one chance to hook in and adjust what the user wrote. But all I'm doing is still writing code. It is understandable code as if the user had written it. And notice that I'm using string interpolation here. String interpolation is great. So the return type of the middle functions is t.name interpolated. So I'm just concatenating strings here. Saves me some plus signs if I have interpolation. I love interpolation. And then finally, for every member, every enumerator that I saw you write and I remembered the name and type and value of, insert it. So there, insert that name is a, type with that const text per value. And then I do other things like toString as well. But all the user had to write was animal flags is a flag enum of u16 type. And I think that's pretty powerful. Giving something a name is super 
powerful. This is like letting somebody write a class. When Bjarne let us write a class, string, variant, we could write a word of power for folks to use that encapsulated a whole bunch of behavior and rich meaning in one word. That's the same thing we're doing here. A word of power for defaults, requirements, and generated members, and it's always opt-in, so we never need to equal delete one of them. And we've had this before. To write a class, to write a function, to write a variable is to write a word of power. Now all we're doing is generalizing the function one to say, and you can write a const exp or a, con a compile time function that can now participate in what a class definition means. It's very surgical, very disciplined, very tactical, but what a powerful hook. Just like when Bjarne designed the very simple and surgical but very powerful hook of, what if you could write your own class? And we're all here. You might have noticed, how many of you noticed when I was going through that slide, that code, that I only looked at the members that were objects? I actually said it, but how many of you noticed I was only looking at the members that were objects? Okay, only a few, all right, it was, it was subtle. Here's another Stack Overflow question, also asked a long time ago, also still current, also popular. I had this Enum class with two members, I would love to write a, a member function on it to just flip between the two states. Can I do that? Sorry, no. Today, yes. In CPP2, you can do it because it's just a type. Types can have member functions. So Janus is an enum type with values past and future. The default is 0 and 1, all that good stuff. They become static const expert values. But I can also write a member function saying, well, forever, for my current value, so flip is a a member function because it has an in out this parameter, so it's a mutating and modifying member function. If this object's value equals past, great, then e this equals future. Otherwise, this equals past. And that was easy to write. This is not a pointer in CPP2, so there's, there's no dereference here. This is easy to write. Notice what it's calling. It's calling equal equal and single equal. So it's calling comparison and assignment. Where do those come from? They're generated by enum. You just saw the code that, that generated the assignment operator, that generated the comparison operator. So at the time I wrote that code, those operators didn't exist yet, but it's okay because I said, this is an enum. They'll be there. Because I, I opted into writing them too. It's as, by writing at enum, it's as if I had written them myself, and I get to use them, and I get to write normal code. So I'm going to go cheekily, and if it looks to you like that head is on backwards, it sure looks that way to me too, but thank you, Stable Diffusion. <laughs> I am going to assert that I've become more and more convinced. I've, I, really, I was very bullish on it six years ago, and I'm only even stronger on it now that I'm actually using it in a real compiler I can, I can work with. This is the way to express types. But I'm not the one who really said it first. Bjarne did. Bjarne has been saying for years that C++ could be 10x simpler. He's been very specific about that. And he's said, and this quote is from 2007, from many years ago, most of the simplification would come from generalization. And that is all we're doing here. We're taking what we have, that one meta function that already exists baked into the language, and we're saying, what if you could actually customize that? It's a single customization point. Generalization. And finally, let's talk about unions. C had a special unsafe union language type. How many of you have cursed unions? C, C unions? But they're useful. Now, you almost never have a, a union without an enum nearby, right? Why? Because you need to track what the current member is. Please don't use an int. At least use an enum. Come on, give me this one. Uh, but everything's unsafe, so you have to roll your own tags, right? And, and of course, we would, a programmer would never make mistakes with this. C++17 has a safer variant. Variant is nice. If you look in the, the CPP front source code, I use variants all over the place. 
is variant better than enum, or than, than union? How many of you would say variant is better than enum? And then I keep saying that, than union. How many of you, if the cameras are not on the audience, they're on me, so you're, you're anonymous to the YouTube audience and, and we're in a safe space here among ourselves. How many of you think that, well, at least in some ways, union is better than variant? Ooh, nice, lots of hands, you're right. And you're, both sides are right. Variant is better than union, and union is better than variant. Variant is better because it's safer. Union is better because it's more usable. Because variant, everything is anonymous, including the variant itself, right? So the variant itself doesn't have a name. So if I have two variants of int and std string, One's for an employee ID uh, or an employee name, however we're, we're, uh, we're talking about them. And the other one is a magic uh, uh, lucky number or a, a word of power. I can't distinguish those types, but they sure are different. And within a variant, we have all this fun talking about, well, what if there are two alternatives of the same type? We can't distinguish them when we have all sorts of rules about when that's legal and when it's not, and you have to get at it by the index. And if you want any, in, any value at all, you have to use std get and pass in an integer index and, and get it that way, or a type. But it's cumbersome compared to union. This is what it looks like today in CPP front. So in syntax two, I just wrote a union uh, meta function. And this code is very similar to what I published seven years ago in paper PO 707. So I wrote it on paper then, and now I've written it in compilable code, which you also find the bugs in your paper because you couldn't compile your paper. Now I can compile it, and so I found the bugs. But it's still basically the same code. I say S is a union type. And for any member like I int, I get a set function and an accessor of the nice name. And you could make different choices. I'm still experimenting with this and what's the easiest way to use it. But it's very clean. When I default construct it, I have like a variant with no current, like of monostate, of no current state. That's fine. Set I, now it's an int. And I can access I. And if I do it wrong, like variant, I can get an exception. So this is safe and it's easy to use. And my hypothesis is that this is the same usability as union, the same safety as variant. It automates what we already teach people today, which is to have the enum to the side so you can name things. That's what you do with variant as well, as you have an enum next to it. So you can actually give names to those index numbers. But I didn't have to invent a new language feature and bake it into a compiler to use it. It's just a class. But I didn't have to write it by hand because I could say, I'm not writing just any kind of class, I'm writing a union type. I was like, oh, why didn't you say so? Great, that will give you all these nice defaults and generated functions and checks for free because you opted in. What was that song again? I think there's a lot of truth in that. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. <laughs> and do not shortchange how powerful the artist class concept is, especially with the const expert work that we've added through the work of Gabi Dos Reis and others to add const expert to it and in C20 in the meantime. Today's C class is super powerful, and in C20, I can express enum as a class. And that it means a lot to me. Now let me just switch topics from features to strategy. Because there are a lot of experiments out there and what differentiates them. And compatibility is something that's very important to me and I keep stressing, but, but why? What kind of compatibility? What plan are you on depending on your choice of compatibility goals as you design a new thing that is 10x better, which a number of groups are trying to do. John Carmack is a legend, not just for his programming chops, but also for his strategy and management chops. This, he's, this is not his first rodeo. He's been around. And here's a quote he wrote oh, about a decade ago, I think. And he's talking about functional programming, but it can equally be applied to any new thing. And in our case, one thing we hear a lot about, rightly, is 
safety, type of memory safety. Let me step you through what John Carmack wrote because I so strongly agree with Mr. Carmack. He said, I do believe there is real value in pursuing functional programming or safety, whatever the new thing is. There is real value in safety. But it would be irresponsible to exhort everyone to abandon their C++ compilers and start coding in, these are John's words, not mine, Lisp, Haskell, or to be blunt, any other fringe language. Just stating it in, a, in a quotable way, the fact that there's, the incumbent has 8 to 10 million users and a and 30 to 40 year mature tool chain. That's valuable. Compared to that, anything new will take a while to catch up and not be just a niche thing. But now notice what he says about language design and design of new languages. To the eternal chagrin of language designers, there are plenty of externalities, so things outside the syntax that we all love to see, that overwhelm, that can overwhelm the benefits of a language. So he's saying, wait a minute, language is one piece. It's the piece that you see every day in your editor, so yeah, it's like it's right there at my fingertips, but it's just one piece. So what externalities? He continues, we have cross-platform issues, proprietary tool chains, certification gates, license technologies, stringent performance requirements on top of the issues with legacy code bases and workforce availability. Does somebody know how to program this language that everybody faces? Right. If we design an, a beautiful new language, everybody knows, well, that's, uh, that's no good on paper until there's a compiler. So we say, and here's a compiler. Yay, that's great. That's a big achievement, don't get me wrong. Designing a, a syntax, a language, and writing a compiler is great. That is step one of approximately 100. And I'm not exaggerating. You have now successfully accomplished step one, to have a hope of being used in industrial code. That's what Carmack is getting at. I gave this talk right at the beginning of the pandemic, and so the video that I, I would recommend the best is the one from C++ on C from 2020, when we were all at home. Uh, so you'll see my office in it. And I call it Bridge to New Thingia because it was all about when we develop a new thing that especially is trying to improve upon an old thing that already exists and is widely used, how do we bridge people from old thing to new thing? And it's directly relevant to answering that question on the screen, which is, anytime you design a new thing, people will ask you, you know, I've seen others try to do that sounds like a lot like what you're trying to do, and they all failed. Why is yours different? So the whole point of this talk was how to answer. Why will yours succeed when all these others that look a lot like your thing have failed? And the answer I'm hammering on is compatibility. Assuming you do all the other things right, assuming you do a decent design, right? Assuming that you assess the user's requirements and actually meet them. I'm assuming those are, are well understood things you've got to get right. But the difference between success and failure, once you've done all these things, most of the projects that do all those things right still fail. What is the differentiator on top of that that has in the past reliably differentiated success? Everybody's seen this picture, right? There was a well-known problem with JavaScript. JavaScript, the good parts, right? And Dart and TypeScript and a few other efforts both aimed at exactly this same problem, the complexity of JavaScript. By the way, I stole this slide from Anders Heilsberg, uh, the inventor of TypeScript and leader of the TypeScript team, because it's like a, just a great summary of like, why TypeScript? Well, look, this is what we got. We want to improve. But Dart also had the same view. And I'm gonna talk about Dart's approach and TypeScript's approach. Now, let me clear the air here. There were other differences. There were political issues or social issues. I don't know about them, I don't care about them. Those are distractions. And some of them may have been important, but I'm gonna focus on the most fundamental technical design, which means technical strategy difference between Dart and TypeScript, which I think is relevant to inform all of us as we evolve C++ and anything. So which of these adoption functions would you prefer? 
your user has to, on option A, has to start putting forth a lot of effort and doesn't see any value at first, but once they've annotated all their code enough and once they've you know, linked the right libraries, installed the right tools, then they start seeing some value. But you, you gotta get them through all this workforce first before they start seeing value. That's an adoption step function. And if the step is high enough as it is in this picture, it starts to look a lot like a wall. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands for how many of us have invented a new thing that had that kind of step function or worked on such a team and discovered how hard it was to get your first customers because of that adoption function. Most of us have been there. What we really want, the holy grail, if it could ever be achieved, and it has, is I put forth in option B a little effort, and I, but I see a little benefit. That was easy. Maybe I'll do a little more, see more benefit, a little more, see a little more benefit, right? This is how those turn-based games draw you in and keep you playing Civilization for four hours when you meant to do just one more turn, right? Oh, I see, I'm not the only one, okay. How do you do it? One of the absolute requirements for that to work is high fidelity interop. The minimum bar, the minimum bar, this, this isn't even the gold star, this is like the bronze silverish star, is that your new thing can seamlessly use old thing. So in darts or TypeScript cases, that you could seamlessly call JavaScript. Let me give you an example of what that can look like. An old thing project, let's call it JavaScript, can add new thing side by side in like, for instance, another, a new file in the same JavaScript project and start seeing benefit. So that would be pretty good if you could create, have a new, any JavaScript project, you could add a new file, you know, in a new syntax or something and start seeing benefit. So that's pretty good, that, that lowers the steps. But the holy grail, the, the thing that, that is just so enticing and easy is if an old thing project can add new thing in one place, if I can write one line of code in the existing project and start seeing benefit. And if that sounds like a pipe dream, Bjarna did it. You could rename pretty much any .c file, it's mostly still true today, rename a .c file to .cpp, and it would still compile, same meaning, you haven't lost anything, and then you could write one class, remember the powerful class, and start seeing benefit. All I did was rename my file extension and add a, two lines of code and I can already see benefit. That's seductive, that's why we're here. But he's not the only one. In the 2010s, TypeScript did the same thing. They followed the same playbook. They said, rename any .js file to .ts, still works. If you haven't changed it, it still does the same thing. And add one type definition and start seeing benefit. Ooh, that was nice. Maybe I'll write another one. And that's how you gain adoption. That's the adoption ramp. If you were in Laura Savino's keynote yesterday, uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you were, what an excellent keynote. If you're watching this at home on YouTube, look at CppCon 2023, Laura Savino, the Wednesday keynote. Run, don't walk. Like, maybe finish watching this one, or, or maybe not. Go watch that one first, then come back here. One of the things she really pointed out was the importance of when we learn a new thing and then we, we're all zealous and we go back home and we try to apply it in our code base and there are constraints. We can't just change the whole world of a huge working code base. That's destabilizing. You can't just change everything all at once. So what do you do? Tactical abatement. You fix this part here in an encapsulated way. You fix this part here, the key parts. You, you pick your targets and start seeing benefit. That's exactly what you need to be able to do. It is exactly a use case for why it's important as we do a major evolution to be able to tactically change one function, rewrite one function in the new syntax to get bounds checking by default and safety and start seeing benefit. That's why this is so important. I love this slide, so I show it every time at this point. It is still mostly true that every C program is a C++ program. 
but it's more than that. You get the compatibility, but you also get the compatibility not just with the compiler, but with the tool chain. Bjarne, dirty little secret, although it's an open secret, when Bjarne invented C++, C with glasses, he didn't write an optimizer for it. Why not? Cheeky guy. He got it for free. He used the other guy's optimizer. Why? Because he transpiled to C. He emitted C. It's still a real full compiler, lex parse, semi lower, but instead of lowering to IL, to IR uh, for the back end, he lowered to C. And then later there were compilers that lowered to IR and said, you could do it with the same compiler. He had the same linker, and so he just worked. He, in fact, that is why from the beginning, you could write abstracted C++ code in the 1980s when, when computers were, were so tiny that you wouldn't do, like your watch is a supercomputer, right? You could write code in highly abstracted C++ with classes and so forth that actually ran faster than the equivalent C code because they're more abstracted, so they express their intent more and Bjarne preserved that through the code generation. And the optimizer loved him. The optimizer loved that code more than it loved the C code. So for example, a sort algorithm in C++ was faster than C sort. Why? Because C sort had to go through the, the pointer to function all the time to, because that's how they customized the, the, the sort function, the sort predicate. Bjarne said, I got me some inline functions. Want one? I don't need no function pointer and his optimizer loved him, but he didn't actually write an optimizer. He got it for free. TypeScript, every JavaScript program is a TypeScript program. Every TypeScript code can seamlessly call any JavaScript code with no thunking, no marshalling, no overhead. It just is JavaScript. It lowers to JavaScript. It just natively seamlessly calls JavaScript. But it's more than that. They also run out of the box on every JavaScript implementation. All the JavaScript tools work on TypeScript programs because it's JavaScript, right? And this is why when I wrote CPP front, I was careful to, to make sure I lowered to the, the parts of C++20 that were well supported on all the compilers. But it's why from the very beginning, CPP front, CPP front has always worked with every major C++ compiler on every major platform because it's C++ because it really is C++ that we're talking about. Let me just make a note about TypeScript because working where I do in developer division at Microsoft, I get a chance to, to talk to the designers of these languages. And when I talked to the TypeScript designers who vetted this slide for accuracy, uh, I said, you know, it's not just that it's compatible with JavaScript. How many of you knew that the TypeScript people attend standard ECMAScript meetings, standards meetings? Oh, good. More, more, a few hands, but more than I thought. Yeah, that's a cost, but it's an important one. TypeScript has contributed, regularly contributes proposals to JavaScript. In fact, if you use just JavaScript today and you, you, for some reason you don't like TypeScript or you've never used it, guess what? You're already using TypeScript features because a number of TypeScript features have already become standard JavaScript features. I'm happy and, and thankful to the committee that they saw value in my comparisons design from CPP2. That is already part of C++20, except for chaining. You can get that in CPP front. And here's my own observation, just by observing their behavior. It does not seem to me knowing these people personally and observing how they behave, that the TypeScript designers view TypeScript as a successor language. It is a separate thing, but it's tied at the hip to JavaScript, and it's cooperative and contributes to JavaScript evolution. If you don't do that, you will be having interop issues forever, because if you don't adopt Seamless interop is just table stakes. That's just the very first thing in your, in your design before you write a line of code. You will never be able to claw it back unless you reset your design completely because you will make decisions that introduce incompatibilities, which is great because you were free to do that. It's fun at that time. It's, it's liberating. 
because you've given up the constraint and it's a severe constraint to have that compatibility. But once you give it up, you can't get it back without a major reset. And you will forever be having improved JavaScript interop open issues. Here is a timeline across the bottom and a version number across the top of guess which programming language? Say it out loud. Python. What's the interesting part of this graph? One of these bars is not like the others. One of these bars does not belong, right? Let's just zoom in there, and I want you to notice the dates. That's a decade. That word decade, we'll come back to that. Python 3 was a source breaking change. By the way, Python 3 was released in 2008. How many of you have graduated university since 2008? Oh, lots. This is how long this has been happening, right? Like to put it in, this is career length time period we're talking about here. Python 3 was a source breaking change to version two, and it really is better. It, I mean, honest to goodness, it makes, it solved real problems in Python. Kudos to the Python 3 designers, like Guido and, and the others. But here's an example of the breaking change, and I didn't notice until I'd shown this slide a few times that the, the breaking change example uses three and two, so oh, haha, that was a pun I didn't even know was on the slide. So, well, there it is. Uh, if you say three over two, three divided by two, in Python 2, the answer is two. In Python 3, the answer is 1.5. This could not possibly be a breaking change, could it? So what happened? Well, there were lots of manual migration tools. They had, there was 2 to 3, there was Pylint, Futurize, Modernize. Can I use Python 3? I love that name. Uh, Tox, not sure about that one. MyPy and others. And many of them were really good. Like you could get like a like 95, 98% accurate conversion and then you do the rest. 95 to 98 is a prototype. Great, you've shown a proof of concept. Now go build the real thing that's usable because 98% is not where near close enough to migrate a large code base. It leaves way too much still to be done by hand. And evidence of that is the fact that there are so many of them. If any one of them was good enough, the others would not exist. And yet we had to keep creating more. As late as 2017, so a decade after Python 3 was released, most Python code was still written in the intersection of two and three, which is terrible. Like, think about it. That means I am, for, for compatibility with either two or three, I am deliberately not using the unique best parts of two or of three. I'm deliberately not using the good stuff for compatibility, which is kind of terrible. In 2020, I'll skip over the pandemic joke here, 2x was frozen and stopped being supported, even for vulnerabilities, even for security fixes. And today, 2023, it's still used. This is the 12-year transition. And it's not quite done, but it's largely done, so let's call it roughly 12 years. But here is from the JetBrain survey. Uh, Anastasia, there you are. Thank you very much for running those. A hand for Anastasia in the JetBrain survey. And for all your helpers, too. It, it takes a team. But if you look at the Python 3 versus Python 2 adoption numbers, this was in late 2019. So this October 2019, and about four months later, Python 2 was end of life, including security fixes stopped. Big, hairy deal. Just a few months later, 10% of Python programmers still said they were using 2x on an about to be super great attack surface. And the latest Python survey, uh, the survey I could find from 2022, we're probably very close to the, to the 2023 one, it's still 2%, and I'm not sure, I won't tell, we'll leave those ones alone, but the 2% the that are still using a language version that has been out of security patches for three and a half years. Dirty little secret, they still do get security patches, they don't guarantee them and they will do them if there's enough demand. And I happen to know by talking with the, the folks involved, I, I, I learned a little trick. If, you, if, if you're using Python 2x, first, please, please, please go to three. I know that sometimes you can't. 
If you can't, and you, you, you have a security problem, and you need it addressed in Python 2x, here's the tip, and you didn't hear it from me, is demonstrate that it has already been fixed in 3, and that is the secret sauce that will make them consider it for 2. It's not a guarantee, but it, that, that path has actually worked multiple times. So because Guido and I now work at the same company, we get to talk regularly. And so I first gave this slide at C++ Now earlier this year. And just if, like literally a few days before, my, my keynote was on Monday. And we had a meeting, I think it was on Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday. And Guido was in the room. And he was wearing this shirt. So I said, hey, Guido, can, do you mind if I just take a picture? I've got a keynote on Monday. And, I, and it's, this is perfect for, the, for that keynote. Can I take a picture of you? He says, oh, OK, sure. The shirt's, shirt's about six years old. He has, I said, I know. But he let me take this picture, and he knows what I'm about to say. So thank you, Guido. This picture is from earlier this year. But the shirt is six years old. Notice what the shirt says. This shirt is not encouraging people to uh, upgrade from Python 2.7 to 2.8, which doesn't exist, or from uh, 3.6 to 3.7. This is a shirt encouraging people to please, please upgrade the major version number, because by the time that Python 2.7 or 3.7 existed. That's the seventh release already of Python 3, and Python 2 was still dominant. And this was already the seventh release, seventh of Python 3. So this says a lot. And uh, when Guido came to Microsoft, we, we had a chance to chat regularly. And so one of the first things I did. Uh, not knowing him well yet, as I, I said politely, hey, you know, we, we're all language designers. We want to learn from each other. You took a, a, a super important and successful language that you, that you built, and you successfully took it through an important transition from two to three. And I know there are pain points, but it, it succeeded, so that, that, which is great. We're dealing with languages in transition, too, with our other languages, C Sharp, C++, anything that's, that's been around for a while is facing this. Can you give us guidance? Like, what would you do differently? I could almost not finish that sentence before he said, we would do everything differently. So, well, what do you mean it, it succeeded? He said, we had no idea of the cost of breaking compatibility. We had no idea. If we had to do this again, we would not do that again. We would do everything differently. And that was a learning that he allowed me to share with you. And it's something that we can learn from as we look for what has worked in the past. How well has it worked? What options are there for evolving languages? This is what a decade of days looks like, just to give us a visual. When Microsoft, my team, before I joined it, shipped Microsoft Visual C++ 6, it was a hit. Shipped in 1998. It wasn't until 2010 where we finally shipped a version of Visual C++ that displaced version 6 in the marketplace 12 years later. For 12 years, our biggest competition was our 10-year-old compiler. C99 added some major features that gave the user community heartburn, and it took them 12 years to walk them back to being optional features. Retroactively optional. This is so cool. Retroactively optional in 2011, bowing to reality. Hey, we're not immune. We, in 2008, voted that for C++11, C++OX, we were going to require that basic string not be copy on write, knowing that GNU and others but especially GNU had a copy on write algorithm and, uh, for basic string. And they supported that, OK. But that was a breaking change. It wasn't until 11 years later that, the, that a major Linux distribution finally made a, the conforming non copy on write SID string the default. And Python 3, what we just saw, was 12 years. Do you notice a pattern? This is a reproducible result. This is what happens every time. Absent other forces, like I'm, I'm assuming you've written a beautiful thing that, that has a great value proposition and that people want and it solves an important problem in a, in, a, in a good way. I'm assuming you got the basics right. 
All other things being equal, if you do not have a seamless backward compatibility bridge, you are going to slow down your adoption by at least a decade. Rust is a great example because they are gaining traction now, and it's great to see a, a new language gaining traction. How many years has Rust existed? Compared to the number on that slide, it costs you at least a decade in adoption. If Rust had out of the gate embraced, and, and they couldn't because of the borrower checker and, and the changes to the, the lifetime model, you have to have a super compatible object model and a super compatible lifetime model. If they had had that, which they chose not to for, for their own reasons, which is fine, if they had had that, Rust would be where it is today, around the 100,000 developer range. They would have been there a decade ago if they had been able to call C++ seamlessly. I'm convinced of that. It costs you a decade. So we have three major options. And here I'm just trying to catalog what we've already learned as an industry as we evolve languages. This is not our first rodeo as an industry. Option one is the what I call the 10% plan. Incremental evolution as usual. Every release you make is about 10% better in some combination of ways. You know, it's 2% better this way, 5% better this way, and next release will fix some other things and improve some other things. Add a parallel STL or add more const expert. And we're on an evolution, incremental evolution path. In JavaScript and other non-C++ examples, this is what ECMAScript did from versions 2 through to 10, except for version 4, where they tried to make a breaking change, and then they had to walk it back. It's what Python did throughout 2.x, and then again within 3.x, and it's what the C standard has done and what the C++ standard has done. And this is fine. It will get you 10%, 10%, 10% with each release. You know, rough, rough numbers here. What if you want to do a 10x improvement? You only get to do one of these about once every 30 years for a major programming language. So if you want to do that, how do you do it? There's two answers that work. And we know what their characteristics are because they've been used repeatedly. So we know what the playbooks are here. The default plan is to design an incompatible new thing that is just like what you want. And this is fine, this is the default plan, this is what nearly everybody does, and it gives you great control over the design space because you don't have the shackles of backward compatibility. You know what you also don't have? The power of backward compatibility. It's a trade-off. Dart did this, this is the Dart plan, but it's also the Python 3 plan, the ECMAScript 4 plan, which didn't succeed. And in the C++ world, Every project I know of that has tried to make a 10x improvement in C or C++ has been on the Dart plan. C cured, C flat, C natural, Cyclone D, .NET used for native compilation, uh, like Rust and others, that's the Dart plan. We're not seamlessly compatible with C++. We're trying to, to fix C++'s problems and have their value proposition, the same value proposition of close to the metal and control and efficiency, but without the shackles or the benefits of C++ seamless compatibility, right? There is a door number three. There is a TypeScript plan. This is the plan that Bjarne used for C++. Bjarne pioneered the TypeScript plan because C++ was a TypeScript for C. It's exactly what it was. It is a fundamental design choice that you make either at the very beginning of a project or never again. Like, you, you have to commit wholeheartedly to this as an, as an inviolable design stake or never, or never look back, or leave it behind and never look back. It means being cooperative with the existing thing. It means committing to seamless interop with the existing thing and being source and binary compatible. C++ did that for C, largely. TypeScript certainly did it for JavaScript. Swift did it for Objective-C. Now, Swift also, there was a nice talk at C++ now about adopting Swift in C++ code bases. So just to be very clear, which is, that's also a fine thing to do, but just to be very clear, Swift is a TypeScript for Objective-C. It is not a TypeScript for C++, right? Because it's compatible with Objective-C. In fact, the Objective-C 
Um, when, when Objective-C got ARC, their, their, their lifetime model, it was because Swift, which had not been announced yet, was using that as their lifetime model. So you could see Apple already building the compatibility bridge because they put ARC and they made sure that the, the Swift object model was a superset of Objective-C's. This doesn't happen by accident. It happens by intentional design, strict discipline, and oodles of hard work. That's the only way this happens. And as far as I know, until I'm now trying this, nobody has tried this plan for C++, and I think it's worth trying. And it's my own personal experiment. I don't know if it will succeed, but I think it's worth trying, and I want everybody to be super clear-eyed about what's going on. These are the three paths. Option A is incremental evolution as usual. We're having all this safety discussion because a lot of people are telling us that option A is not good enough anymore. So we should be looking at option B or C. I want us to be clear-eyed that these are the options. If we go for a 10x improvement, there are two plans that are known to work. You're either on the Dart plan or you're on the TypeScript plan. It's one or the other. And you choose that the moment you put pen to paper at the beginning of the project before you write a line of code. Now, there are costs to this, too. So being clear-eyed means also acknowledging the costs. Now, I've implemented some things in the Dart plan. So I'm responsible. I led the design of C++ CLI, C++ CX, C++ AMP, because I didn't want, we didn't want to do language extensions, but we couldn't express the things we needed to express in C++ as it then was. As I've said many times with meta classes and now with CPP front, one of my cherished goals is I never want to have to design C++ CLI again or C++ CX again. I want to have a language powerful enough through reflection, through compile time code generation, so I can do it in the language. So that's always been a core goal for me. But I know what the wrapping goal looks like. If you are in the incompatible Dart plan, you are going to be wrapping, doing wrapping strategies for interop. You're going to be doing marshalling, thunking. Sometimes you will get seamless interop, but it's usually because somebody wrapped certain popular types in the standard library for you. It's not a general thing where all C++ code just works. But there is also cost to the TypeScript plan. It's the cost of cooperation. Being inclusive and included in the C++ standardization world, being cooperative, participating within instead of against, that language's continued evolution. What does that look like? If you see a, a, a new 10x improvement bringing proposals to standardization, bringing its features that could be adopted to today's C++ syntax, that is a big, bright sign that they are on the TypeScript plan not on the Dart plan. If they are designing their own, well, you know, concepts are great, but we have our own concepts because they're better. Or we, we like modules, but we have our own modules because they're better. That's the Dart plan. And again, that's the default plan, and it can be valuable, but let's be clear-eyed about which one, which plan we're on. And they both have costs. So I, I admitted on stage here last year that I've been leading you down the garden path for about seven years, eight years now. Every talk that I've given, every paper I've written for the Standards Committee has been drawn from this work that I'm now putting under a new syntax, but these proposals can work for today's C++ even as just incremental evolution proposals. And so I've been proposing them there to validate them, to get feedback, and I thank everybody in the community and with the response to talks and the Q&A and the comments on YouTube and in the committee for their, when we've made technical presentations and their feedback on those that have made these proposals better. Thank you very much for those things, but I intend to continue bringing these things to today's C++ in, with its syntax as it is today also. But compatibility is a constraint. Here is a thread from the contract subgroup, strategy group mailing list just last week. Searching for a keyword alternative for assert, because we want to write assert contracts in the middle of a function, and the current syntax is square bracket, square bracket, assert. There's this, this macro. This macro gets in the way, that, you know, C, that C put on, onto us. So what do we call assert instead to get around the incompatibility with the C macro? There's over 100, about 100 replies in that email chain, and that's just the most recent email chain about this. And here are the, the 
examples that Timur Dumler, thank you Timur for letting me use this, uh, went through and actually did a code search in a body of code that we use a lot on code search, isocvp.org, It was a big, big body of open source code, and see how often are certain words used. You see, we actually do do our homework to try to make sure we don't do breaking changes. One of my favorites. Moving right along, here are ones that are, are verbs, some of them pretty Baroque, but they're also nouns or short forms of nouns, and I won't even pronounce the fourth one. <laughs> and Timur said, you know what? So where is the bar here numerically? Because in C20, we actually took away the word requires from you, from the community. We actually made it a reserve keyword. But we didn't do that with co-yield, and they both had not that different numbers of thousands of hits. Both were breaking changes. Yeah, co-yield had maybe twice as many. Three times as many. It wasn't like 100 times as many. So why didn't we take co-yield? Ooh, I don't know. That could be one reason. It would break the standard library. And there's a learning here. I'm showing you this because it gives you an insight into the, the care and thoughtfulness that goes into standardization, but it also illustrates a principle. We all know naming is hard when you find names for things, even when you get to invent brand new names. But compatibility is a major naming constraint. All the good names are taken as soon as you ship version one, because if you didn't take them in your standard library, your users wrote variables and classes with those names. All the good names are taken as soon as you, sh you ship version one. So now consider this whole program in CPP2. Notice anything interesting about the code? Shout it out. At sign and what's after it? There's all sorts of key reserved keywords here that C++ today reserves. There's that assert macro. So I'm actually using the SG1 syntax that they can't use. I'm following what they did and I'm using that syntax because I can. This is the inherent power of having an alternative syntax is you get to make any breaking changes you want, including you get to make existing names mean the right and safe thing. You get to fix mistakes. You get to make names mean what you think they should and not have to worry about a breaking change. That is powerful. So let me show you something here. We're gonna go a couple of minutes over, but I think you'll find it worth it. So I'm gonna go over, and here's some CPP2 code. So let me show you what this looks like. So here I have a triplet that's a struct type. It's got you know, three ints. It's got a state enum type that has running, paused, and idle. It has a next state function, because remember, we can write uh, member functions inside enum types. That's because it's just a type. Would you prefer that I put this back here and use this to avoid feedback? Is this better? Okay. And then I have this name or T, which is a union templated type. That's the same as saying angle T colon type, just using a default syntax, where I can have a union of a name or a T, the whatever type the user provided. And then I have a two string function that returns the string or the thing the user provided as a string using the as conversion. And then I have a little main. Here, let me show you just what the main does. So we start the program. Trip is a new triplet, so notice new returns a unique pointer. You can see that down here. And then the triplet has values one, two, three, like we would expect, because it's just a C++ type. We're gonna look at our assertion. So assertion, that unique pointer is non-null, so this, uh, this assertion will succeed. Yes, it did, great. Now status is state running, what's that? That's value zero because that's the first state I said and they default to zero, one, and two. And so while the status isn't idle, then I just print out the current state, so there we see running. Then I go into the next state, so let's look at what it does. So the next state says if this equals state running, state is paused, okay, that's fine. And then we return. State still isn't idle, so now we print the current state, which is now paused, 
we go in and we say this time, okay, now we go into the else this time. If state is paused, yes, then state is idle, which terminates the loop. Okay, and now we have a vector of int with 10, 20, 30, 40. We create a name or t, that union type that we created. We make it a name or a std vector of int. Then we set it to be the value of a vector. So now the active member of the union is the vector, so it's safe to access it. So for every element of that vector, print out its value, and there we see the values, 10, 20, 30, 40, and that's it. So that you can see the different parts being used in combination. What did I just demo? Debugging in CPP2. What else did I just demo? Compatibility. This is what compatibility looks like. When I, for, I, I there's a gentleman in the room, hi Aaron, who worked on the C++ debugger team at Microsoft, and I told him verbally, the other side of those doors yesterday about this demo, just verbally what it would be, and here was his question. Are you admitting the CPP2 code into the PDB? And I hesitated because I wasn't sure how to answer that. No, but yes, yes, but no. I didn't write anything special. I just admitted C++. And the, the C++ compiler emitted the code into the PDB. It just worked. The CPP front compilers emitted hash line directives for where the CPP2 code was. So the debugger looked in the CPP2 file, not the CPP file that was generated, and the debugger just worked. This is what compatibility looks like. Uh, Philip, can we ask you to come up to the stage if we can get you a microphone as well? Uh, please welcome Philip to the stage. Hello. So what are we looking at here? And so this is Visual Studio Code running on Mac, right? So I'm gonna start playing the video that you recorded yesterday. So what's going on here? So yeah, so I've been trying to check if I could debug the inspect ex expression, which is complex because it's doing a lot under the hood. And it's a pattern matching, so it's going through checks. Is the type is what is expected, so it's, it's an empty, uh, is an, is an plain old struct which is created above. So it's like from, from the C++ old thing. Um, we can, we can check if something is empty, and for example here, I've checked if uh, default stood any ends as an empty, and it, it does. And we have uh, ability to inspect the variant, so we create the variant with int, so we capture it, and yeah, and the variant with the stood vector of ints uh, as well, we can go through, um, and yeah, and we capture that. And it's jumping back and forth, and it's obvious when you see the when when you know the details what is behind it. It's a pure C++, like lots of ifs, and the last jump is to the closing braces. So, if we will put the line lower, it will jump nicer. That's it. Thank you very much, Philip. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. And Neil. Neil, could you come up and show us another short demo as well on your machine? We've got your machine ready here. And this time we're going to be seeing different development environments. So that was Visual Studio Code, but, and using the inspect statement. The inspect statement was we demoed last year, but um, this is now. Hello. So I've got a demo program I've written in CPP2 here. And it is going to print out a short menu of some food items. So firstly, we have a, a food type, it's a struct. It has a name, a price in the real world, which I know is a double, which is frowned upon. CPP front can't even solve that. And then it has a resort markup. Don't ask me where I got the idea for this, but we're going to multiply the real world price by a resort markup and print out the price that people are gonna pay. Then we have a main function, which is just gonna call another function, pass in the year. Then we're going to construct a vector of some food items, print out with a bit of string interpolation, then a loop, and we'll print them all out. So I'll jump over to Xcode first. 
This is Xcode 13. Uh, presumably, Herb's not allowed to touch a Mac, so I think that's why I'm here. I can touch a Mac. I don't know about Xcode. So I've broken in the main function, and now I'm going to step in. And so I'm going to construct the vector. And we can have a look in Xcode. And we can see the, the vector here with all the types as you'd expect. And the call stack, and this is all CPP2. So I'll keep going. And so we're printing out down here. And so down at the bottom is LLDB now? So this is running on the LLDB, and so you have access to all your usual commands, whether you run from the command line or with an Xcode. So this time I'll just run again. So I've constructed the vector. And we can have a look at the frame. We can print the menu. Everything you'd expect just works. And so let's jump over to Qt Creator. So I've got the same code here. This time I've got some breakpoints set in different places. And so we break in main, and so I'll continue. And then we break down here at the for loop. And again, we have the usual things we'd expect. We have access to all the locals and, and arguments, and the call stack, and the threads. Thank you very much, Neil. I wanted to show you that. I could have actually done some of that demo last year, only I didn't have types implemented, and there wasn't time. Kind of wasn't time now, so thank you for bearing with me for a few more minutes. This is what compatibility looks like. This is what I mean when I say it's still 100% pure C++, even though the syntax is an alternate syntax that's unfamiliar today. C++ 11 syntax was unfamiliar and new, and now it's standard because the standards committee said so. They're the ones who say what standard C++ is. A new syntax can become standard. Seamless interop is important not just for calling libraries, but for tool sets, build systems, debuggers, visualizers, profilers, linkers, custom in-house tools, test infrastructure, everything you already have. So like I said before, when you have a compiler implemented for a new language, that's great. That's a big achievement, and it is step number one done. And now you can go on to the rest of the road for industrial use. And I'm going to repeat because we read it before, but it may have even more impact now, because this is exactly what Carmack was saying. I do believe there's real value in pursuing functional programming, safety. But it would be irresponsible to exhort everyone to abandon their C++ compilers and start coding in Lisp, Haskell, or to be blunt, any other fringe language in comparison to C++. To the eternal chagrin of language designers, there are plenty of externalities that we just saw demoed that can overwhelm the benefits of a pure language design. We have cross-platform issues, proprietary tool chains, sound familiar, certification gates, licensed technologies, and stringent performance requirements. On top of the issues with legacy code bases and workforce availability, this is what it means to build a language for the industrial world, for heavy, real commercial use. So there's the Dart plan and the TypeScript plan. They're both very well understood, and they trade off. They each have benefits. Dart plan gets less constrained evolution at the cost of compatibility and a 10-year adoption delay. TypeScript plan has the overhead of working with the existing committee and community, but also leverages it, which is a huge accelerant. So my theme is I want 100% pure C++ just nicer. What if we could do C++11 feels like a new language again, but this time for the whole language as an intentional directed evolution, a second alternate syntax, with two goals. Make it 10x simpler, 50x safer in those four main safety areas, and 
by resetting the complexity bar, give us a new platform to do the, the usual evolution as usual incrementally again for another 30 years. That's what I want to leave with you. Thank you for coming to this talk. Thank you for coming to this conference. There is much more yet to come, so please enjoy your lunch and enjoy the talks coming up this evening. And don't miss Andre's keynote tomorrow on AI and C++ and binary search. Oh my, you'll love it. Thank you. <laughs>